Turn with me, please, first of all, to Second Peter. Chapter three, verse three. Something we pointed out before. Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of the creation. But when they maintain this, it escapes them, that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world was at that time being destroyed. But the present heavens and earth by his word are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. It's interesting. The first time was by hydrogen, and the second time may be by hydrogen bombs. But what happened in the days of Noah will happen again. We have a teaching, a recording on Moriel uh, television, which is just as it was in the days of Noah. And it was something I did approximately close to 30 years ago. And we deal with the Nephilim and these things and how these things are going to be and are being recapitulated before the return of Christ. Uh, and all of the things we said 30 years ago have either happened or are in the process of happening. But that does not make me a prophet. It makes the word of God true. Other people other than myself have, of course, said these things but we did say it and it's there and we would advise you to watch it if you haven't seen just as it was in the days of noah that is not our main subject today but our main subject does relate to it one of the things that happened as noah warned people and it is reckoned he did so for approximately 120 years as noah warned people what was going to come a judgment and warned about the need for repentance, and so forth. He was mocked. When he said the judgment of God was going to come, he was ridiculed and belittled. Now, we've talked about this subject before. I can handle it when unsaved people, when the world mock, when you tell them Christ is coming, that the judgment of God is coming that there's going to be an antichrist on the earth, that there'll be a great tribulation, that the day of God's wrath is coming, and that there is a rescue, a rapture. I accept unsaved people think this is nonsense, and they reject it. And I expect them to reject it. But what do you do when you have people claiming to be Christians who mock it? Again, when you have people like Rick Joyner, uh, or speaking against the rapture or mike bickle again somebody who says the rapture of elijah was god's judgment on elijah or someone like gerald coates the rapture is a fantasy and a myth uh or even of the devil what do you do when you have someone like chris rosebro mocking the people who believe in the antichrist and the mark of the beast he openly mocks it he openly mocks it. 
we have clips of him openly mocking belief in taking the book of Revelation with any sense of literally being taken literally as a prophecy and mocking, mocking people who believe in an antichrist and a mark of the beast. And of course, he was promoted in, in Scotland by, by Studio Scotland and Bethel Communications by the, by the men laws. They promote this man, have promoted him. We can prove it. These people that we see doing these things are what Peter, under the Holy Spirit, warns were going to happen again. People like that were around in the days of Noah. People like that are around again in the last days. You have those people who mock what the word of God says prophetically and those who promote them. And this is what's happening. Well, first of all, we're told to expect that's going to happen. But turn with me, please, to the book or the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir to the righteousness, which is according to faith. This is Noah. He was warned. He did as God told him, and the condemnation came. Now notice, there's a relationship between him building the ark and the coming of the condemnation. Noah completing the work that God told him to do in preparation and anticipation of escape had something to do in correlation to when the judgment itself came. Peter also speaks of this, saying, we can hasten his coming we can make him return faster. We can make the rapture take place sooner by carrying out the Great Commission faithfully. And so he was told to build the ark. And Peter and Hebrews tell us these things have a meaning for the faithful believers in the last days. Again, I would point you back to an earlier recording from some decades ago now just as it was in the days of Noah, where Jesus said it's going to be just as it was in the days of Noah. Repeatedly, the New Testament links the days of Noah with what's going to happen at the close of the age. But as then, there will be a rescue. There will be an ark. Now, people have the idea that the Lord is just going to beam us up. He's just going to rapture us out of here. Don't worry. It's just going to be the hard pezzo. He's going to beam us out of here. That is true, but it is only half the truth. Peter again says we can make it happen faster. And relating this to the saga and epic of Noah, it has to do with building an ark. We can build an ark. Look with me, please, if you will, to the book of Genesis, chapter 9, verse 29. So the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died, nearly a 1,000 years. Methuselah, the grandson of Enoch, lived longer, but not by much. A 1,000 years longevity. Quite an account. Obviously, with the flood, with the fall of man initially, and then with the flood, bioentropy increased, human longevity was reduced because of sin. These people actually did live to be centuries. Now, why is that important for us? 
because it's going to happen again in the millennial reign of Christ. People are going to have that kind of longevity. God tells him, build the ark. I know it's a very familiar passage of scripture and we won't read all of it, but turn with me, if you will, please, to the book of Genesis. We'll begin in verse eight. With all of this moral landslide, with men turned to violence, with incarnate, incarnated demonoids coming from the sky, procreating with human women, things that we see beginning to take place again with biogenetic engineering in the hands of fallen man and an increase in interest in UFO phenomena, somehow these things will be just as it were in the days of Noah. I'm not talking about the Nephilim conspiracy theorists, but I'm talking about an exposition of what Genesis says. Again, I'd refer you to that recording. God tells him, I'm going to blot these people out. I'm going to blot out man. And he was grieved in his heart. I'll blot out man whom I created from the face of the land. And with man, the animal species. But Noah, in verse 8, found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the records of the generation of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Now that is interesting in itself, the term walk with God. Enoch had walked with God. This does not imply Noah was raptured, but it does use the same language that describes the rapture of Enoch. Noah's walking with God has a rapture connotation. And Noah became the father of three sons through whom the human race is descendant, Shem, the Semites, Ham, the Africans, and Yafet, the Eurasians. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God. The earth was filled with violence. Indeed, Jesus said this in the power of the wicked one. And God looked on the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. The earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I'm about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms that shall cover it inside and out with pitch. And this is how you shall make it the length of the ark. 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30. 350 and 30. We need to take account of those three numbers, 300, 50, and 30. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Notice it only had one door, one door. And behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is breath of life. From under heaven, everything that is on earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. Every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every kind into the ark and keep them alive. With you they shall be male and female. 
Notice they were not gender neutral. This gender neutrality in itself is a sign that we are again in the days of Noah. The present movements we are seeing, attacking sexual identity, biological natural identity is being legally decreed as irrelevant, even though it's scientifically uncontestable. This is how depraved man has become. This is how depraved man was in the days of Noah. Of the birds after their kind, now that word kind in Hebrew is mean. That's where you get the word sex, mini. Sexual relations were to take place within the species, within the kind. And of the animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind, two of every kind shall come to you to keep them alive. And as for you, take for yourself some of all food, which is edible, and gather it to yourself, and it shall be for food for you and for them. Then Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. So he did. Then the Lord said to Noah, enter the ark, you and all your household. For you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. You take with you of every clean animal by sevens, a male and a female, and the animals that are not clean, two, a male and a female. Notice the kosher and the unkosher animals, the edible and the inedible, by what would later become Hebrew dietary laws. But this shows us that the concept of kashrut, of kosher, pre-existed the Torah. I point you to another recorded teaching. We have kashrut and famine, the typology of the Hebrew dietary laws, where we expand upon this and its meaning. You shall take with you of every clean animal by sevens, seven pairs, a male and a female, and of the animals that are not clean, a male and his female. Also of the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female. We keep offspring alive on the face of the earth. For after seven more days, notice that seven, I will send rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. The number of testing in the Bible, divine testing. And I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I've made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. Now Noah was 600 years old when the flood of the water came upon the earth. Then Noah and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him entered the ark because of the water of the flood of clean animals and animals that are not clean, birds and everything that creeps on the ground. There they went into the ark of Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came about after the seven days that the water of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the seventh day of the month, on the same day, the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were opened, and the rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Before this, the earth was irrigated by a natural mist. And on the very same day, Noah, Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them, entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creeps on earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds. Notice God is very specific about kind. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh, in which was the breath of life, that everything that has breath praise the Lord. In the Psalms, Kol Shema Tel Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And those that entered male and female of all flesh entered as God had commanded him, 
and the Lord closed it after him. And the flood came upon the earth for 40 days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. There's much we can say here. It was reckoned in the Hebrew scriptures that a month was rounded to 30 days based on Daniel chapter 9. The amount of total time Noah spent in the ark with his family estimates have ranged from 360 days based on Daniel 9 and some have gone up to 370 and some beyond that. So it's not a wide range but there is a range of 360 to 370 and a few have taken it as high as 377. Now this gets complicated if you're reckoning in lunar or solar terms and various other considerations I won't go into at the moment. However, it is not impossible to understand that the periods of time in the ark, the seven that he has to get on and the door closes, and then the 40 days, okay? And then the 150 days of waste, of, 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 of everything being, of the water levels rising following the rain and everything being flooded and destroyed. And then another 40 days of uh, simmering of the water as the birds are released. It is not unthinkable that those periods of time will be replayed in the book of Revelation in the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments. I'm not dogmatic about it, but they can give us a clue when we relate it to the 1,260, 1,290, and so forth. Certain commentators have done that. Certain conservative evangelical commentators have done that. I only mention it in passing. It's not our main subject tonight, but it should be borne in mind. What is clear is that what happened with Noah is going to happen again. There's only one window and one door. Jesus made it clear, I am the door. He is the door. The ark, of course, represents God's vessel of salvation. That is the true church, to which Jesus is the door. You can't be born into a church. You can't be baptized into a church. Even though we believe in believer's baptism, baptism does not save. You must be born again, obviously. Christ is the door and the only way onto the ark. He is the only way of salvation. Religion cannot save. Good works cannot save. Sacramental rituals cannot save. Being born into a family professing to be Christians cannot save. None of that can save. There's only one door. And that's a personal saving faith in Christ as sin bearer, and as the risen Lord. So we've got the door. And there's one window. There's only one way to look upon the outside world. Only one view. Only one panorama. There's only one way to look upon the world. And it's not from the point of view of the vain philosophies of men, as Paul describes them in Colossians. It's not from the point of view of religion or of personal opinion. 
none of those things will give you a right perspective of what's really going on in the world. We must look at the world from within the body of Christ. There, the Lord will give us a clear view. This is somehow comparable to Habakkuk standing on the watchtower, standing on the word of God to see what's coming prophetically. We are to look at the secular world. We are to look at the temporal world as members of the body of Christ who are secure on the ark. We are to look at business, finance, career, education, healthcare, everything, marriage, everything. We are to look at everything temporal from the perspective of somebody who's in the ark, who is saved. Any other view of the world is a distorted one. Seeing it from man's perspective is useless. We must see it from the perspective God has given us. We don't look at the world from the perspe perspective of religion or human philosophies or personal opinion. We look at it from the perspective of what God shows us as his people who've been saved, who are secure on his ark. Well, we can hasten his coming. The ark was pitched within and without. Many people have speculated as to what this means. Some believe it is the Holy Spirit. I think that is a good interpretation. It holds the rest of the ark together. The Holy Spirit unites the church and he is outpoured on the church. It's within and without. The door is no mystery. The New Testament tells us Jesus is the door. But then we have those three numbers. The 300, the 50, and the 30. Remember, we are called to build the ark, to build a faithful church of survivors, of people who will spiritually survive, ultimately be raptured, although many will be martyred. As they always have been. The 300, the 50, and the 30. We hasten his coming by building the ark. The Lord could not send the flood until the ark was built. The Lord would not send the ark of the flood until the ark was built. He had to provide for his faithful people. But by them building the ark, it made the flood come faster. Hasten his coming. As it says in Hebrews 11, because of what he did, of what Noah did, it brought the judgment of God. His judgment is coming on the kingdom of Satan. His judgment will come on the kingdom of Antichrist. Despite those who deny there is an Antichrist and those who promote those who so teach such error. Let's begin with the 300. In biblical typology and numerical symbolism. Solomon placed 300 small gold shields in the temple, 300. But we know 300 was the number of Gideon's army, of the elect, of the real warriors, of the real fighters, of those who lapped up with their hands, of those who were desperate, of those who wanted victory, of those who would go up against the invader, 
from Ein Harod at the orifice of the Valley of Jezreel at the uh, foot of Mount Koboa, opposite what is there today, Elon, uh, Elon More, the, 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 the Mount of More, not Elon More, the Har More, Har More, sorry. Har More is just opposite where the invaders were. And of course, Gideon's army had the torches inside the pitchers and broke them. We are earthenware vessels. We are broken, shattered, that the light of Jesus may come out. But there comes the victory. It was only 300 that did this. The rest were seen as unfit. You look at all the people in the world who call themselves Christians. Many are in false Christianity. You were never born again. Liberal Protestantism, World Council of Churches. Just look at the joke the Church of England is, or the Church of Scotland. Obviously, the Roman system and the Eastern Orthodox system. Then, of course, the cults, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, Christadelphians, etc. The biggest Christian so-called small C sect in the world is the Roman Church. It's a billion people. Are there true believers in the Roman Church? Yes, but if they are true believers, they will get out. The Holy Spirit will show them, come out of our my people. And that is the same for liberal Protestantism. subtracted. Those who follow the word faith money preachers, the con artists, mammon worshiping pseudo evangelicism of the televangelists, they subtract that. Those who subscribe to the ecumenical movement and the new apostolic reformation, you subtract that. Two billion people, two and a half billion, some would say, claiming to be Christian. I don't know what 300 corresponds to now proportionately, but you're going to be left with a Gideon's army. There'll be 300 getting on that ark. There will be a faithful remnant. There will be a faithful church. 300. As with Gideon at Ein Harod, there will be a testing, an elimination process. God was not looking for quantity. He was looking for quality at Ein Harod. He's looking for Gideon's army. And he still is. He's recruiting his 300. The Lord is recruiting his 300. The first characteristic of the church that is going to be ready for the return of Jesus and that is going to prepare the way for his return is that it will be the Gideon's army of the day. It'll be the 300 not necessarily only 300, but what 300 represents, the true army of God. Now, the true army of God of Gideon have a heavenly partnership with Hatseva Ota Shemaim, the hosts of heaven. That word we translate hosts in Hebrew is Tseva it means armies. There is an alliance between the armies of heaven, the angelic armies of the Lord, and the faithful army of the Lord here on earth. And it is assured victory. In 
in the age of the Church of Laodicea and lukewarm Christianity. There's not a lot of interest in building an ark in many churches. There's less and less interest in prophecy in the return of Jesus. And you have people, again, like Rick Warren, telling people to avoid the subject in direct contradiction to the specific commands of Jesus. You have this lukewarmness of Laodicea. They're not going to be in the 300. Unless they repent, they will not be in the 300. The Lord is looking for his 300, whatever that number may be. He's looking for his Gideon's army. He's looking for his 300 shields to hang in his temple. Don't expect popular Christianity or Christendom or all who claim to be evangelical to be on the ark. You've got people mocking it. Just like Peter said, people claiming to be saved Christians mocking it. Let's go further. 300. Then we have the 50. The 50. We all know pretty much what the 50 represents, Hamashim in Hebrew. It is the morrow day at the end of the Omer, the time from Passover to Hag. Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, that Christians call Pentecost. The birthday of the church, so-called. Previously, the church only existed embryonically until the Holy Spirit was poured out. A Holy Spirit-filled, a Holy Spirit-empowered church. Now, one of the things we see in Scripture then the power of the Holy Spirit is he's the spirit of holiness. He empowers us to overcome sin. Cigarette smoking, porn addiction, or whatever it's called. In my case, it was literally illegal drugs. I couldn't have quit on my own power. I wouldn't have had the desire to. It was his spirit that empowered me to beat my drug habits as a young person. I know others, the Holy Spirit empowered them to beat alcohol addiction. I know others, the Holy Spirit empowered them to overcome homosexuality and lesbianism. We all have our faults, our weaknesses. We have an old nature, the sin that so easily besets, but there is a before and after story in every true Christian. And it's because of the empowerment and indwelling of his spirit. There are those who try to make tongues or even counterfeits of tongues, but tongues, the proof of being spirit filled. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of holiness, a moral life, a godly life is the first thing that is emblematic and reflective of the 50 of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not a cessationist, as you know. I am a continuationist. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit, understood and practiced biblically. But to stop the ark from being built, Satan has tried many things. He doesn't want people to think about the 300. Oh, just put your faith in Jesus and you'll be raptured. Don't worry about this, that, or the other thing. Don't worry about preparing for the last days. The whole pre-trib 
illusion. Now we have to be concerned. Secondly, those who again tell us to avoid studying the return of Christ like the purpose-driven agenda and those who even mock it like Chris Rosebro and people like this. Mockers will come. No, Satan doesn't want the 300, but neither does he want the 50. And there have been two primary attacks on the 50. One has been the counterfeit, the very kinds of counterfeits we read about and are warned against in 1 Corinthians. Hypercharismatic lunacy, ultra Pentecostalism. As Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, if the ungifted, idiotai in Greek, or the unbelieving, unsaved people, enter and see this chaos, will they not say you are mad? Any unsaved person watching a maniac like Michael Brown running around yelling fire, fire, pushing people over will say that man's crazy. Anybody watching John Arnott or Rodney Howard Brown or the Elam movement in England and watch, watch what they did and would say these people are crazy. These things are counterfeits of the Holy Spirit. Satan does not want the ark built. He does not want the 50. The fruit of the Spirit is a crete, self-control, not the lack of it. Not people imitating animals and having uncontrolled gyrations on the floor. and giving prophecies that are simply clairvoyant and tongues that are gibberish. This is not to deny real tongues or real prophecy. That is the first attack on the 50. Satan does not want the 50, so he counterfeits the real work and ministry of the Holy Spirit, whose fruit is self-control, not the lack of it. His other attack on the 50 is cessationism. The false doctrine that says that these gifts of the Spirit ended in the first century with the apostles. With no exegetical argument, it is all asegetical. We are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, that these things continue until the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's not a prophecy about the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation does not have a definite article, ho apocalypsis, it just says apocalypsis. In other words, The revelation is not, is not the book, it's what's in it. It's the things predicted in it that are the revelation. The events culminating with the return of Christ. These gifts, you will be not lacking in any charism until he comes back. Well, so it goes. Cessationism is a false doctrine. It is as wrong and as false on one extreme as hypercharismatic lunacy is on the other. As I've said before, the theological term for hypercharismatic lunacy is neo Montanism. Neo Montanism. This kind of insanity has happened at different periods in the history of the church, one of the first being the Montanists in Asia Minor, in the early centuries of Christianity. Satan is attacking 
oh, there is no gifts of the spirit. There's no tongues, no prophecy. The perfect is come. Well, if the perfect has come, we no longer need faith and hope. In exegetical context, in 1 Corinthians 13, the three greatest are faith, hope, and love, but the greatest is love. Right now, we see through a glass darkly. Then we shall see plainly, clearly. Then we shall know as we have been known. It will not be in any sense nebulous. We will no longer need hope and we will no longer need faith. If the perfect has come, as those teachers of error say, we don't need faith and we don't need hope. But the New Testament tells us repeatedly, we need faith and we need hope. We're saved by grace through faith. Cessationism is a false doctrine, and those who teach it are teaching error. It is little wonder that you have the MacArthurites who believe this error and propagate this error or teaching other error about the return of Jesus, such as it'll be possible to take the mark of the beast and still be saved and born again, or John MacArthur's confusion between the blood of Jesus and the death of Jesus. Satan does not want the 50. He does not want the 300. And he does not want the 50, but God does. And to build the ark, we need the 300. And we need the 50. Those who are spirit-filled and have the spirit poured out, pitched from within and without, gives us our unity and holds us together. But then, of course, we have the 30. There is a word in English I dislike very much. I think it is a phony word, at times a hypocritical word, and even in certain contexts, a stupid word. M-A-T-U-R-E, mature. I don't mean like as in matured fruit or something like that. The world's definition of mature is not God's. In Hebrew, the word mature is boger, and it's the modern Hebrew word for a graduate, like from a university. What mature means in the original Hebrew scriptures is somebody who retains their childlike qualities, but adds to them knowledge, wisdom, and abilities that children don't have. I'll say it again. Someone who retains their childlike qualities, but adds to the childlike Qualities, knowledge, wisdom, and ability that a child does not have. In the world's thinking, you get rid of the child to get the adult. <laughs> it's all phony and distorted. Why don't you grow up? That means, why don't you become like me? or like the world. In God's economy, it's different. Now, Paul said when he was a child, he did the things of a child. That's true. However, in the nature of a child, Jesus said, unless you come like one of these little ones, just a natural trusting faith in Jesus, 
receiving the kingdom as a little kid. The innocence of a child, not as yet corrupted as much with the world, although it has a fallen nature, not as corrupted as yet by the world. Seeing God as a loving father. We do not you lose childlike qualities in God's definition of bogera, which is translated maturity. We retain those qualities, but add to them knowledge, wisdom, and ability. To the world, maturity means becoming like the world. To God, maturity means being conformed to the image and likeness of Christ. Jesus began his ministry when he was about 30. King David began his reign from Hebron when he was 30. The time of the prophet Samuel. Saul was gone. David was 30. Jesus was 30. Now, if someone was saved later in life, it's different. But if someone was saved in childhood or had the advantage of coming from a Christian family or was saved as a younger person, by the age of 30, they should pretty well know what God is calling them to do and be about doing it. It is the number of Boger. It is the number of God's definition of maturity, again, not to be confused with the world's. Thirty. Three hundred. Those who are up to the task, the fight, and aren't afraid of it, the 300, the Gideon's army. The 50, those who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, they live moral lives because he's the spirit of holiness, but they are empowered by the Holy Spirit. He's poured out on them, pitched within and without. and are united with others who are like-minded and of the same spirit. But then we have the 30. The 30, a boger. Well, let's take the modern Hebrew definition of the term, a graduate. A graduate is not someone who's merely literate. A graduate is someone who is learned. Now, we're not necessarily speaking about an academic education. There are unsaved people who are learned in the wisdom of the world. We're talking about being learned in the wisdom of God. Those who are learned in scripture, who understand doctrine, who understand the nature of the battle with the flesh and the world and the way the devil operates, who understand our destiny, who understand their own role and the purposes of God. the 30, the 50, and the 300. Satan does not want the 300. He does not want the 50. And he does not want the 30. Satan loves biblical illiteracy. Loves it. He loves experiential theology. 
loves it. Satan hates those who know the word of God and who know how to apply it under the guidance and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't like those 300. The ark is under construction. There's one door, one window. In the age when even Christians are being seduced into the interfaith movement, I'll always remember the book that Satan inspired Peter Kreef to write that was endorsed by J.I. Packer, the reformed Calvinist theologian, and by the late Nixon Watergate criminal who said he became a Christian, Charles Colson. I'm not his judge, but he was super ecumenical. Evangelicals and Catholics together. They endorsed a book that said Mohammed and Buddha isn't were in heaven. That we have to unite with Islam and have ecumenical union with Islam to morally redeem society. Or Rick Warren's global peace plan. We have to unite with Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims and those who worship other gods to bring in global peace. They want an ark with more than one door. There is one door and one door only, and that door is Jesus. He's the only way onto the ark. Well, you have a narrow view. No, I have a very broad view because I'm inside the ark looking out. There's one window. You're circumspect. Those in the ark are focused. One window, one door. 300, quality over quantity. 50, neither hyper-charismatic lunacy nor cessationism. Both are wrong. The 50, that which is spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, spirit-led, spirit-directed, and whose guide is the sword of the spirit, the scriptures. And then the 30, not those who are conformed to the world, but those who are conformed to Christ, his kingdom, his dominion, his reign. The ark is under construction. God says 300. God says 50. God says 30. He told Noah 300. He told Noah 50. And he told Noah 30. Now, by his spirit through his word, he tells us the exact same thing. The cloud is coming Judgment is going to fall. Build the ark. I've got to get you out of here before I judge this place. Build the ark. Just like I tell you. 350 and 30. Thank you so much for listening. 
and joining us here on Word for the Weekend on RTN, Christian TV, Scotland. God bless and have a great weekend.